Okay, so um, welcome everybody to our second installation of Next in Science. Uh, the idea here is to bring together uh, early career scientists who are working in somewhat allied but not too closely allied fields uh, to present their work. The idea being that a lot of times the most exciting science is being done by uh, early career scientists who are, in a sense, I wouldn't say putting their chips on the roulette wheel, but finding interesting new fields that look like they're going to be promising. And so as a result, you get treated to things that are uh, more interdisciplinary and uh, you can expect them to grow in the future. So it's very much uh, a frontier set of talks that we have today. Um, my name is John Huth, and I'm uh, a physics professor in the uh, university here, and I'm also a Ventures faculty member with the Radcliffe Institute, which means that I get to do programming. Uh, I'm hosting a science symposium on October 28th, which some of you may be interested in attending. It's on oceans. We're going to talk about life in the very early oceans uh, here on the planet, uh, then talk about the role of the ocean in driving climate and the feedbacks between climate and the ocean, and then finally, of marine life in the ocean uh, with a particular emphasis on New England. Uh, prior to that, on October 24th, we have a talk by Kerry Emanuel, who is a uh, climate researcher at MIT, and his particular field of interest is extreme climate events, in particular driven by rising sea temperatures. And he is the author of a paper describing the emergence of something called a hypercane, which is a super hurricane that forms, so the idea being with rising sea surface temperatures will have fewer hurricanes, but the ones that we do are more severe as a result. So you may want to tune in for that. Uh, all of these are open to the public. Uh, and so today's uh, Next in Science, we're bringing together four uh, scientists who are going to talk about their, their work, uh, broadly based in astrophysics and astronomy. And I've chosen chose the speakers in part because they will talk about astrophysics and astronomy on different scales. And so we're going to start with the largest scale, the universe as a whole, and kind of work our way into um, smaller territory. I, just, I always bring a little bit of my own interest into this. I'm interested in astrophysics because I'm a particle physicist. I do work at CERN at the Large Hadron Collider. And one of the intersections there is we're looking for forms of matter that might explain the structure of the universe, and in particular, uh, some of the work that CORE is doing informs us on what kind of particles may be out there. So that's one reason that I'm interested, but I have a more immediate and somewhat parochial interest. I'm teaching a freshman seminar, and we're talking about early models of the universe, and then we'll get into modern cosmology at the end of the seminar. And one of the things that we're reading in two weeks is The Divine Comedy by Dante Alighieri. And one thing that struck me in The Divine Comedy was that, that hell is a lot more interesting than paradise. If you read it, you know, there's all these details and you can really get your teeth into it, but then you get paradise and it's all this ethereal kind of floaty stuff that says, oh, you, you can't understand it because there are mysteries out here. And then, you know, about, you know, 25 cantos of mysteries that you can't understand gets a little tedious, right? So I thought about it a bit and wondered why was this, why, why was this? And when we had this panel together, I suddenly realized that, that in Dante's era, he knew a lot about geography. He walks all around, you know, Tuscany and sees all the waterfalls and all sorts of things. But the knowledge of paradise is very limited. They just have this Aristotelian model and, and these, these ideas which are kind of vague and ill-formed. But Okay, seven centuries later, we have these, these amazing instruments that allow us to give us windows deep into the universe and back in time. And you can put flesh on the bones now. I mean, you can imagine a trip to Jupiter, or you can imagine a trip to Mars, or you can imagine what it's like in the very early universe, and, and even the sound of the cosmic microwave background radiation. So you could almost imagine that if Dante was born now, and he went to write the Divine Comedy, Paradiso would be this amazingly detailed and would be every bit as good as the Inferno. So this is one of the lessons that I hope to impart to my, my freshmen in my seminar. So, um, so having said that, um, let me introduce our first speaker, uh, Cora Dvorkin. She is, let's see if I can do this without looking at my notes. She is from Argentina. She got her doctorate at the University of Chicago in 2011. And 
Um, she recently joined the faculty in the Harvard Physics Department last year. Prior to that, she was a Hubble Fellow in the Institute for Theory and Computation at the Center for Astrophysics. Did I get it? Yes. Great. Um, so uh, Cora's work is in the universe, the structure of the universe at large, drawing on a number of different uh, data sets and windows. Uh, and it's proving to be a remarkable picture where we're able to understand a lot of details of the structure and how this reflects on the matter content of the universe. So uh, without further ado, um, let me introduce, well, I am introducing her. Oh, she's also the Schutzer, Schutzer Assistant Professor at Radcliffe. Sorry about that. And her title of her talk is Deciphering the Early Universe, Connecting Theory with Observations. Let me uh, also tell you that the talks are back to back, uh, Cora and then Salvatore. <coughs> and then at the end of those two talks, we'll take questions up front. So uh, keep your questions, write, write them down, hold them, and then we'll take them, um, and then we'll have a break. OK? So. Thank you very much for the introduction, and thank you very much for the invitation. It's really a pleasure to be here. So today, uh, as John said, I will try to make heaven more interesting. Uh, I completely agree with your opinion of the divine comedy, so <laughs> hopefully we can make it all better. Uh, so I will talk about deciphering the early universe, connecting theory with observations. OK, so for this talk, I chose one sort of uh, direction in which my research has been going, which is trying to understand the physics that seeded the first structures in the universe, trying to understand what gave rise to the structures that we can observe today. And for this, I will be talking today about how we can probe the physics of the er very early universe by using observations of something known as the cosmic microwave background, and I will go in, in detail into what this is, and the large-scale structure of the universe. So let me, start, uh, let me start by showing this picture here. This picture here represents 13, this line of time, represents 13.8 billion years of the universe. So the universe began as a hot and dense plasma of particles in thermal equilibrium at very high energies. The universe expanded and cooled, and many physical processes happened along the way. Some physical processes we know very well. Some of them, we don't know what's the physics uh, that gave rise to this process. And, and some of us are interested in trying to shed light on this physics. So, Interesting uh, pro pro uh, processes that happened along the way are recombination about 0.4 uh, mega years after the Big Bang. Protons and electrons combining through hydrogen. This period is known as recombination. <laughs> and since then, the universe became mainly transparent to cosmic microwave background or CMB photons. So since then, photons mainly free stream toward us until, when the ra until a time in which the radiation from the first stars and quasars reionized the universe about uh, 500 mega years after the Big Bang, and about 6% of these photons rescatter. 6% comes from the latest uh, data set coming from the Planck satellite, okay? So mainly they free stream <clears throat> toward us, until this period in which a very small fraction of them rescatter. And so today, we observe these photons at microwave frequencies and at a temperature of about 2.7 Kelvin. So I thought I would give to this general audience a, a little uh, history, just this slide of history of how the cosmic microwave background was actually found. So in 1964, two astronomers, Arno Penzias and Bob Wilson, they were radio astronomers looking for sources of radio waves, and they were uh, looking at radio waves with their ant antenna in New Jersey. And they were finding an excess isotropic noise in this antenna built at Bell Labs. The, the story, uh, the myth says, and actually this is true because I've heard 
uh, Bob Wilson telling the same story that they even thought it was droppings from pigeons in their telescope. They climbed the telescope, they cleaned the telescope, and this excess noise would not go away. At the same time, in parallel, uh, Peebles, who was here yesterday giving a historical lecture at the CFA, uh, Jim Peebles, Dick, Wilkinson, and Rawl, they were, uh, they were doing theoretical calculations and they predicted that there should be a signal of about three Kelvin coming from the Big Bang. There were two disconnected groups. One of them had no idea about the CMB uh, expectations. And uh, an astrophysicist from MIT, Bork, talked to Penzias and Wilson Penzias and Wilson repeatedly were trying to find people to tell them about their source of noise that couldn't go away. They talked to him, uh, they talked to Burke. Burke told them about the work from Peebles et al. And uh, they told them that they, they were very likely finding uh, something very big, something that was very sought for. And so the story, uh, ended with them announcing the discovery of the cosmic microwave background, and years later they won they won the Nobel Prize for this. So this is a neat story of, you know, uh, a discovery that came accidentally in some sense because they were not looking exactly for it. Okay, so in 1992, uh, fluctuations around this temperature of the CMB were found. So in 1992, a satellite known as COBE, the Cosmic Mic uh, Background Explorer, found that the CMB mainly follows a black body distribution with a temperature of about 2.7 Kelvin and fluctuations around this temperature of one part in 10 to the five. And this is a map of how COBE sees these temperature fluctuations. This part over here is the galaxy that has to be masked because it's so bright that if we don't mask it, we would not be able to see these temperature fluctuations. And because of this discovery, uh, this team also won the Nobel Prize. Okay, so this is a more current picture coming from data taken by the Planck satellite. The Planck satellite was launched in 2009. It took data until very recently. Papers are still coming out from the analysis of this uh, data. This uh, is a snapshot of the very early universe. And in this talk, I will explain why I make this claim. So what is observed here is the temperature fluctuations at different positions in the sky. And the idea is that by measuring the statistical properties of these temperature fluctuations, we can infer the physics from the very early universe. These temperature fluctuations have been measured to have uh, an RMS temperature of about 100 microkelvin, and their distribution is Gaussian at first order. So <clears throat> the CMB power spectrum, the, the, these temperature fluctuations, when I say power spectrum, I mean the square, of this, the square amplitude of these temperature fluctuations. This temperature, the CMB power spectrum has been predicted, as I already told you, and measured with great precision over the last few decades. And I'm showing you here a plot of the temperature power spectrum of the CMB as a function of angular scale in the sky. So scales here correspond to smaller angular scales and scales here correspond to larger angular scales, okay? In red, I'm showing you the data that has been taken by the Planck satellite. Notice the error bars on this data set. These are, this is a really remarkable measurement. In green, I'm showing you the best fit model for this data. This best fit model works very well. And um, I will be talking about, in the next slides, about the standard uh, model that uh, we have in cosmology today. And the structure of these acoustic peaks carry a lot of physics inside. The structure of these acoustic peaks carry the information of acoustic oscillations in the photon baryon plasma at the time of recombination, okay? So the photons 
were strongly scattering with the electrons via Thomson scattering. The electrons were uh, interacting with the protons via Coulomb scattering. And all of, this, all of this was going together. Baryons were trying to fall into gravitational potentials coming from the dark matter. And they were going out due to the pressure of the photons. So there was, uh, they were oscillating inside and outside these potential wells. And this is why we see acoustic peaks. The first peak is the, the baryons and the photons going in the, the gravitational potential. The second peak actually corresponds to a trough, but because I'm squaring it, it's seen as a peak, corresponds to the photons going out. And, and this is what we observe. That's why we see the peaks in the temperature power spectrum of the CMB. Okay, so here is where we stand um, in cosmology today. We have a standard model of cosmology known as lambda CDM. We have a homogeneous background and we measure the parameters of this background very well. We know by CMB and large scale structure observations that we have approximately 5% of baryonic matter. Baryonic, when I say baryonic matter, I mean the matter that we can observe. You, me, the stars, the planets, this building, every, the matter that we are used to and that, that is visible to us. We have 27% of cold dark matter, and it's matter that only interacts gravitationally, but doesn't, it's not visible. And we have approximately, we know from observations that we have approximately 68% of dark energy, which is, uh, which is a source of energy that we attribute to the, that we attribute the expansion, the accelerated expansion of the universe that is observed in recent times. On top of this homogeneous background, we have perturbations that are uh, seeded in the very early universe. We measure these perturbations to be nearly scale invariant. They, they nearly, they almost do not depend on the scales considered. And as I said before, they are approximately Gaussian. So we made a lot of progress in measuring all of these parameters with very high precision. However, big questions remain. What is the lambda of our lambda CDM standard model of cosmology? What is dark energy? We don't know. What is the CDM of our lambda CDM standard model of cosmology? What is this cold dark matter that is observed? And what gave rise to uh, the the, what gave rise to the first structures in the universe. So I, uh, I do research in these different lines, but today I thought, given that I have 30 minutes, I will focus my talk on some questions uh, we are currently trying to answer as a community uh, related to the physics that seeded the first structures in the universe. So this is what I will base my talk today in this question. What is the physics that seeded the first structures in the universe? Okay, so inflation was a theory for the very early universe proposed by Alan Guth and others in 1981. Alan Guth is a professor at MIT. And this, this theory uh, that goes under the name by inflation is the main paradigm that explains the observed inhomogeneities in the universe today. It is a, inflation is a period of accelerated expansion in the first fraction of the second after the Big Bang, and it explains why the universe is approximately homogeneous and spatially flat. We had several problems before the theory of inflation was proposed, the problems were related to why the universe is observed to be so flat, why the universe uh, is observed to be so uh, homogeneous at very different scales. So this theory came uh, into place. It was proposed to, as a solution for these problems. So in the simplest model of inflation, there is a single scalar field, and by scalar field I mean a field that takes different values in different positions and, and a, common, a more common, uh, a more common uh, scalar field that, that we are very used to is, is, for example, the temperature, okay? That's a scalar field. So this field takes different values at, at different positions. So in the simplest models of inflation, there is a single scalar field slowly rolling down uh, a potential. This scalar field is known as the inflaton field. 
So while it rolls down the potential, while it rolls down the potential, um, different modes, different uh, perturbations in this field stop being in causal contact. When they stop being in causal contact, and by this I mean that they cannot exchange information with, with each other, um, a perturbation, so an, an initial seed is frozen, okay? And this initial seed is what then gives rise to CMB fluctuations that we observe today, okay? So the square amplitude of this initial seed, I will, I will uh, call it the primordial power spectrum, okay? Which is the square amplitude of this initial seed that gives rise to uh, the observed CMB fluctuations and the observed large scale structure of the universe. So the idea is that the field during inflation takes different values and these different values are associated with the, the CMB fluctuations at different angular scales in the sky. So the idea is that by looking at different angular scales in the sky, in the CMB power spectrum, we may be able to probe different regions uh, of the inflationary potential during inflation. Okay, so this is the link. This is an inverse problem that we have here. We have the observations of the CMB power spectrum, either temperature or polarization, and we want to understand the physics of the very early universe, a fraction of a second after the Big Bang. So our goal as a community, and my goal uh, in, my, in one of my line of research is to shed light on the physics of inflation by using CMB observations. This is just... Um, this is just an example of work that I have been doing uh, on reconstruction on this inverse problem, on taking data measured by the Planck satellite of the temperature uh, of the, the photons that come from, from, from the Big Bang. This temperature data has been measured by the Planck satellite and trying to reconstruct this primordial power spectrum that is the seed for these uh, fluctuations that we observe today. So this is a reconstruction that we did using uh, with Vinicius Miranda and Wayne Ku using temperature fluctuations. And an ongoing work with a graduate student at Harvard, George Soviet, is to make a full reconstruction of the primordial power spectrum by using not only the temperature fluctuations of these photons, but another property of these photons known as the polarization. And I will talk about this in a few slides. Uh, we can also infer the shape of the, of the inflationary potential, and here I'm showing it here. We can put constraints using data from the Planck satellite or WMAP satellite or many other telescopes that are uh, all over the world. We can put, try to put constraints on the shape of the inflationary potential to see how this inflaton field is moving along the potential, if it's moving slowly, if it has abrupt features in the way. Uh, so, so this is another example. And we can make predictions. I talked to you about the temperature fluctuations of the CMB photons, but the CMB photons are also polarized. They, they, uh, they oscillate in, in, in particular directions. This is what is uh, the polarization of the CMB fluctuations and so with temperature with measurements of the temperature fluctuations we can make predictions to what we should observe for the CMB polarization and this and, and we can learn about the physics of inflation looking at these predictions now another question that we can ask is I talked to you about one field or a particle, if you want, during inflation. Can we probe other primordial particles during inflation? Can we probe physical properties of these particles? And so I am just showing you this slide just for you to get an idea of what you can do uh, with the large scale structure of the universe. Primordial particles affect the large scale structure of, of the universe in very distinctive ways. So for example, uh, work that I have been doing over the past few years is related to probing primordial particles with spin two. When I say spin, I mean 
um, a quantum mechanical inherent angular momentum of the particle. So we can probe primordial particles of spin 2 by looking at the statistics of the ellipticities of the galaxies, and this is another talk per se, but I just want to give you a feeling of, of some work that uh, I have been doing and it's being done in the field. You can also look at the galaxy velocity field and try to probe primordial particles with spin one. This is work in progress with my postdoc as Alec Moradineshad. And in principle, higher spin particles, uh, which are studied, uh, which have been you know, studied for a long time by string theorists and predicted, in principle, they should also leave an imprint on the large scale structure of the universe. And this is, this is uh, more subtle and it's part of work in progress. Okay, let me tell you in my last 10 minutes about the polarization that I already mentioned of the CMB and how you can hope to learn about the energy scale at which inflation happened using the polarization of the CMB fluctuations. So the CMB polarization is linearly polarized and by this I mean that it oscillates in, 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 in distinctive planes, okay? The polarization is generated by a process known as Thomson scattering, scattering of photons of free electrons. So the photons scatter of free electrons, and each electron along the line of sight sees a local temperature quadrupole, okay, a local temperature uh, distribution that is the source of the polarization that we observe today. We can decompose the CMB polarization. One usual decomposition, this is just the basis, but one usual decomposition is to decompose it into E and B modes in the same way electromagnetism is decomposed into E and B modes. Here, just to give you a picture of how the E and B modes of the CMB polarization look like, so the E modes have their direction either radially, they are oriented, they are oriented radially around cold spots or tangentially around hot spots. And the B mode has the same uh, orientation as the B modes, but rotated by 45 degrees, okay? So that's how we decompose the polarization of the CMB. So different processes give rise to different types of polarization. <coughs> you know, density and velocity fluctuations plus linear evolution just nothing happened to these uh, photons. You, this gets rise to E modes. Now, in order to have B modes, uh, you can either have B modes by a process known as gravitational lensing. Gravitational lensing is the bend of the, the is how the photons bend their path when they are traveling toward us because of massive structures in the universe. Massive structures in the universe curve the space-time and the photons bend their path toward us and this is known as gravitational lensing and this effect uh, gives rise to B-modes. And another source of B-modes comes from primordial gravitational waves. I believe Salvatore will talk about uh, gravitational waves but uh, perhaps not primordial gravitational waves. So bear in mind that this, this will be two types of uh, gravitational waves. So gravitational waves arise from inflation because we expect to have quantum fluctuations in the space-time fabric of the universe that gets expanded in this accelerated, in this period of accelerated expansion, a fraction of a second after the Big Bang, okay? Those are the gravitational waves and that's why they are exciting because a measure, well, that's one part of why they're exciting, but a measurement of these gravitational waves would, would provide us with information about the, the, quantum, the quantum properties of the metric. So it, it, it will tell us something about quantum gravity. So gravitational waves also, so as I told you, distort space-time, and this creates a quadruple that each electron sees as well along the line of sight, and this source is polarization. And they leave an imprint into the B-mode uh, polarization. 
Here I'm showing you just so that you have a picture of what these B modes look like as a function. When I say multiple moments, I mean angular scale in the sky, okay? So remember that these are large angular scales and these are small angular scales. This is the B mode power spectrum. In black, I'm showing the B mode uh, power spectrum coming from gravitational lensing, from the way the photons bend their path due to massive structure in the universe when they are coming toward us. And in blue, I'm showing you a potent, so a signature of gravitational waves for a certain amplitude. I just picked an arbitrary amplitude here. Uh, these two peaks correspond uh, to scattering of photons of free electrons happening either at the period of reionization at these very large scales or at the period of recombination at these much shorter scales, smaller scales, sorry. And, and the goal here of this, uh, this, this, um, this um, line of, of research is to try to find out if these gravitational waves are, are present or not. And, and, and so this line of research puts limits into the possible amplitude that these gravitational waves can have. So there interesting because they we can learn this from this amplitude of these gravitational waves we, we will be able or we could potentially we don't know if we will ever measure them but hopefully we will we could potentially uh, learn about the energy scale of inflation so a measurement of uh, gravitational waves would not only provide a direct measurement of the expansion rate of the universe during inflation, during this 10 to the minus 35 seconds after the Big Bang, but also it would provide a measurement of the energy scale of inflation. Okay, so this quantity R over here um, is a measure of the amplitude of the gravitational waves. So if this quantity is, say, greater than 0.01, we it, this would imply, or it's, if it's the order of 0.01, this would imply that the energy scale of inflation is of about 10 to the 16 GeV. Think that the LHC goes up to perhaps 14 TV. So this is a TV, a TV is 10 to the 3 GeV. This is orders of magnitude larger than, than uh, what any possible accelerator ever built, not only now, but ever built in Earth, can ever reach. So this is a window to the highest energy scales in the universe. This, this, uh, this, these energy scales are way larger than any energy scale that, uh, that could be proved now, that was proven in the, pa that was proved in the past, and that could be ever probed in Earth by, a, by an accelerator. These are current limits uh, on primordial gravitational waves. Uh, the takeout message from, from this plot is that we are making progress uh, in putting limits on this amplitude of the primordial gravitational waves, but they have not been detected yet. Um, this is work that, that I did in collaboration with the BICEP team and the Planck uh, satellite in which we combine their data with other data sets coming from the Planck satellite that could be a source of confusion with their data sets. And this source of confusion comes from, from uh, something that we, we cosmologists call foregrounds because they are a source of noise for us. Some other people study these. Uh, they are not foregrounds for other people, but for us, they are foregrounds. They, these other sources of confusion come from uh, emission from polarized dust particles uh, in the galaxy that could be uh, confused with, uh, with primordial B modes. So the quest for primordial gravitational <coughs> waves is continuing and will continue. I'm showing you here an approximate raw sensitivity as a uh, plot as a function of years. Uh, WMAP was a satellite uh, in the early 2000s. Planck I talked about Planck, it was launched in 2009, and it was another satellite, and now 
as a community, as a big community effort, we have recently proposed uh, an experiment that we call CMB stage four. It's a stage, the different stages really grow from stage one from to th stage two, three, and four, they grow uh, in order of magnitude of number of detectors that we need. Uh, this CMB stage four experiment proposes building different telescopes all over the world to map the sky and to be able to map these temperature and polarization fluctuations of the CMB. This is my final slide. This is what we expect uh, to have as, an, as a constraint on this quantity R that was measuring the amplitude of these primordial gravitational waves. So uh, here we are around this number, 0.03. With CMB stage four in the last uh, four, in the fourth year of CMB stage four, this is just a projection that we made as a community, we expect to uh, reduce uh, this error bar by about a factor, you know, between 10 to, to 100. Uh, this came out very recently, actually. This came out this week in a science paper that we wrote. And in this book, we not only talk about possible science that you can do with the CMB stage four proposed experiment to learn about the physics of the very early universe, but for example, I was uh, leading a dark matter chapter in which uh, we also propose different physics that you will be able to learn with the CMB stage four experiment about dark matter. There were other, uh, you can also learn about neutrinos, dark energy, etc., etc., etc. Okay, so I will end here uh, with my conclusions. So I show you that we can probe the shape of the inflationary potential by using CMB observations, so by mapping observations that we make today with the very, very early period of the, the universe. Um, we talked about how large-scale structure of the universe offers a unique way of probing physical properties of, this, of, of other possible primordial particles. And I show you the, the current state of the art for constraints at the moment. We are constraining. We didn't measure anything at the moment. But here are the constraints and gravitational wave amplitudes. And you should really stay tuned, because in the next decade, we will expect to tighten these limits on, on the amplitude of primordial gravitational waves by a lot, and perhaps uh, even measure it. There are many experiments uh, that are built that are currently proposed, that are currently taking data, uh, such as BICEP3 and Keck at different frequencies, EBEX polar bear, spider class, advanced ACPOL, SPT3G, Simons Observatory, CMBS4, Lightbird, Pixie Core, etc., etc., etc. In blue, I just put the ones that I have been uh, that I have been involved in, in writing proposals. But these are, these are lots of experiments that are being proposed, and, and this is really a, a, a golden era, hopefully, that, is, that will come uh, for primordial gravitational waves. OK, thank you. No questions, right? Uh, yeah, we're going to hold on. Okay. No questions. So Salvatore is originally from Italy. He did his undergraduate work at the University of Bologna. And he did his doctoral work at the Paris, Pierre and Marie Curie uh, University in Paris. Got his doctorate in 2012. And then he joined MIT as a postdoctoral fellow and then became a research scientist. And he is now or just about to become a member of the faculty at MIT. Yeah. And he has been working on gravitational waves, direct observation of gravitational waves, not produced primordially, as Cora was talking about, but produced in very violent collisions um, in the universe at large. And in fact, uh, most of you, many of you probably saw the uh, news of the discovery of gravitational waves. No spoilers. Uh, what? No spoilers. No spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> OK, sorry about that. <laughs> and I even, even hear the sound of it. Are you going to play us the sound no, of it? I can make the sound, but <laughs> well, that would be even better. OK, so the talk is Everything You Wanted to Know About Gravitational Waves But Were Afraid to Ask by Salvatore Vitale. Yeah, OK. Thanks. Thanks, um, Yeah, I hope you can hear me well. 
Um, so the, the way this talk is, is made is it basically anticipates the Q&A, and it's a long series of Q&A. I've been asked to talk about what I do for a living, and this is gravitational waves, basically. You can see here two black holes rotating and emitting gravitational waves. Well, you cannot see them, they're black, but okay. Um, okay, um, I will, if you have questions, we have the Q&A later or uh, coffee break. So let me ask with the very first uh, basic question that you may ask if you don't spend your whole day thinking about this thing is what are gravitational waves? If you, if you open a, a, a physics textbook, you, a good one, you find typically sentences like this. They say that gravitational waves are ripples in the space-time continuum emitted by any system with a non-constant quadrupole moment, okay, which is not particularly enlightening. You can look at the, at the Einstein equations, okay? And actually, it's pretty trivial. You start from the Einstein equation, you perturb your metric, uh, crank the machinery, and you obtain gravitational waves. Now, I could spend the next 25 minutes talking about this, but I, I care about you, so I'd rather use <laughs> images, okay? So this will give the idea well at the zero order. Uh, if you take a, a, a small stone and you, you, know, you throw it in a, in a pond, which is a rest, it will create a perturbation at the center where something happened, and this perturbation will propagate outward, okay? So in this example, the, uh, you know, the waves are just a perturbation of the water, and the continuum is the, the, the pond. In our case, uh, the continuum is just the space-time, and it's a very stiff material. It's very hard to deform. This is why our stones need to be much, much bigger, and... Uh, in particular, in what I, uh, what I do, I focus on uh, compact objects, which is a fancy way of calling neutron stars and, and black holes. If you take two of these objects and you make them spiraling, sp spiraling around each other, they lose energy, and this energy goes into gravitational waves. And you know the image is pr very similar to what you've seen before. OK, uh, so you may think, oh, this is pretty similar to electromagnetic waves. You have charges that move and they emit electromagnetic wave. And there are points, uh, you know, in common. There are similarities. There are also important differences. Uh, the one that I, I, I like to think about is that, well, in, in, in Cora's talk, you have seen that the electron and the, you know, the photon interact, interact, they interact with everything. The gravitational field is very different. It's much uh, more shy. It doesn't interact with anything, basically, OK? This means that while light that you receive from star, uh, pulsar, quasars, whatever, can be easily absorbed, obscured, bent, deflected, reflected, whatever. Gravitational waves do not have this issue. They basically can go from one side to the other of the universe and without being disturbed by anyone. And I hope some of you at least will have recognized my quote from Neil Young, but if not, it's OK. Um, I should have used Bob Dylan, but I didn't have time to change the, the slides. OK, so how do we detect these gravitational waves? Uh, to answer this question, we should first look at what they do when they go through something. And what they do is that they, well, they basically change the space-time itself. And the way this gets manifest is in uh, the fact that if you have observer, free-floating free -floating observer, which means, you know, pendula, for example, the distance between these objects will change with time. So that if you start, for example, with four particles put in a ring, four masses, and the gravitational wave passes by, the ring will become an ellipse. So uh, the space will, uh, the distance will increase in one direction and uh, decrease in the other, and so on and so forth in alternative mode. So you may think, okay, it's easy. The only thing I need to do if there are, to check if there are gravitational waves is put a few things around, monitor their distance. If I see that the distance is varying with a characteristic pattern, there you go, gravitational waves. It's not that easy, though. So don't believe the smiley face, because if you do the numbers, you will find out that the typical gravitational wave will uh, introduce a relative distance, which is a variation, which we call strain, of roughly one part on 10 to the 21. And this is a very, very large number. OK, so you have to be able to measure very small variation. When we give talk around with my colleague, we typically use the example of an atom. This is an hydrogen atom. And you go inside the nucleus, which is a proton, and go on inside, inside, inside. And this is the proton. And the variation we need to be able to measure is the one you will see here. It's pretty small. OK. Now, not many of us have seen protons in their life. So I found another image which I like best. It's not about length, it's more visual. If you go to the seaside and count the grain of sand, 
you'll get a very large number. If you do the same exercise everywhere in the coastline of the whole planet, if you believe the questionable web page I found where they do this calculation, they found that it's a few 10 to the, to the 21. So the measurement we need to do, it's uh, comparable to being able to remove one grain of sand from the whole planet and see the difference, okay? This is what we are doing. And for us, desperate and crazy as it may be, luckily for us, there were people in the past who were not scared by you know, this uh, task. In particular, you have a picture of, of Ray Weiss, who is a, a professor here at MIT, who in the 70s uh, got pen and paper and showed that you can actually build an apparatus that can measure this kind of variation in, in length. Okay. And uh, this original idea uh, was, was developed, and in several tens of years later, it became what we call LIGO, which stands for Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. Now, I will not go through the math or the details, but I want to give you an idea of how it works. LIGO is basically, you can see two pictures, there are two of them. It's an interferometer, for those of you who know what I mean, of arms four kilometers long. The way it works is the following. You have laser light, like this one, just a bit better, entering uh, an apparatus, it's a mirror, half of the light goes up, half of the lights continue, and there, there are mirrors at the end, so the, loud, the light bounces back, now, this is not a typical interferometer. It's, uh, the, the light bounces back cutting forth a few hundred times. Then it goes out and is recombined here. Now, light has the nice property that if you combine it in the right way, it can interfere in a way that cancels out, basically, so you have darkness. And this is the condition in which we keep our instruments normally. Now, if a gravitational wave passes through, uh, because of what I told you before, this length will change in a way, and this direction will change in another way. So the interference uh, condition at the end is not met anymore, and we will see some light coming out. Um, so this is the basic idea of how we use laser interferometry to measure very tiny variation in distance. We have uh, two of these instruments in the US. One is in Louisiana, the other is in Washington state. And there are a few others which are uh, either being built or planned around the world, and altogether they work as an, a network, okay, to increase our sensitivity. Um, okay, so uh, what I do uh, for a living is more about learning something about the sources of these gravitational waves. So what can we learn? Uh, well, if we go back to our pond, uh, you can imagine pretty easily, I think, that if you are sitting, you know, on the, on the, uh, on the side, you don't see what has been thrown to the pond. You only receive these waves coming to you. If you are very good at uh, physics or mathematics, you can think of using you know, the, the shape and maybe the relative distance between this wave front and so on and so forth to learn something about what happened in the middle that caused this perturbation to start with. And this is exactly what we, well, I do at least. Um, so my uh, um, objects of interest, as I mentioned before, are compact objects. And these are leftovers of very massive stars after they end their nuclear fuel and they get supernovae and explode. What is left in the middle, it's either a neutron star, which is somewhere in, this, in the carbon nebula, or a black hole, which you're seeing him here hitting his companion. Now, both these categories of objects are, come with pretty many open questions, and they're very interesting objects. Otherwise, we'll be here. So the first one, neutron star. And uh, neutron star, you probably know this. We are talking of uh, objects which have roughly 1.5 uh, times the mass of our own uh, star, but packed together in a radius of 10 kilometers, okay? Now, these conditions are so extreme that, in fact, uh, pretty much uh, like in Cora's uh, um, CMB example, we cannot reproduce this condition in the lab. So, to be frank, we have no idea how matter behaves in this condition because we cannot make them at Earth. So one of the things I want to do is studying this neutron star is learn something about their, comp their composition in the question of state. Uh, another interesting thing is verify whether, as uh, many astronomers seem to think, uh, neutron stars meshing one on the other are responsible for what we call GRBs, which are very bright and energetic flashes of light that we sometimes see, or if they produce most of the metal in the universe. Metal means everything uh, heavier than uh, uh, helium in this case. And another related question uh, is, what is the maximum mass of the neutron star? We don't really know, and it has consequences in nuclear physics. 
things get even weirder when you move to black hole because you have even more mass, uh, you know, and even more compact. And now these objects, and I will come back to this in, in, a, in a minute, produce extreme gravitational field. Uh, now, a priori, there is no reason why Einstein general relativity should work for those guys. So this is the first probably question that comes to mind. Einstein, uh, you know, inventor, discovered GR to explain what was happening in the solar system, which is a very quiet, you know, place as compared to black holes. And it's a several order of magnitude extrapolation. Of course, Einstein was Einstein, so it seems to be working, which is very annoying. Uh, I'll come back to this later. Anyway, so uh, there are several other questions which we want to answer, like how fast can this black hole rotate around their axis? Uh, we don't know. There are conjectures, uh, for example, by Hawking, that says that there is a limit on how fast these black holes can spin. But we would like to verify whether that's the case. We don't know how big they can get, or rather, we know that they can be either a few times our sun or millions or, of times as massive. We don't know if they can have any value in the middle. And we don't know when they first uh, form in the history of the universe. Some people may even, even th suggest that they may be uh, dark matter or whatever. I mean, for us crazy, something nice about physics is that for us crazy as your theory is, there is someone already thought about it. Um, okay, to tell you what I mean uh, by extreme with, a, with an image, uh, let me use Saturn, which I think uh, uh, all of you have seen once in your life. He has this beautiful ring and so on and so forth. Now, if Saturn were a black hole, you would see something like this, which you know if you have seen Interstellar, the movie Interstellar. This is a black hole with a ring. But you see a pretty striking difference between Saturn and the black hole, is that the ring in the black, to black hole also goes you know, up and down, which seems very weird. What is going on is not that uh, uh, the ring is going up and down, is that the black holes are pretty aggressive objects. So if my eye here, and the, uh, here on, the, on the right, and looking at the black hole this way, what happens is that the photons emitted by the side of the disk, which normally I should not be able to see because it's on the other side, try to escape, for example, vertically or with some angle, but they get attracted by the black hole, by the gravitational pull of the black hole, so they are deformed and they, they go this way, which means that I can see basically, uh, facing the black hole, I can see the rear of the, of the ring, both the upper side and the lower side. So this is something which is pretty far from what we typically think and uh, imagine or experience in our own life. Um, okay, so this is about the sources. How do the waves look like? Um, for my work, I, I focus, as I said, on binary compact objects. So I have two objects, like two black holes in this cartoon. They start their life, well, the part of their life that is experiencing for me, uh, interesting for me, uh, around each other, they're orbiting faster and faster, emitting gravitational waves. When they're far apart, we talk of in spiral, and is this, this is the gravitational waves they emit, so this is the variation on the space-time, basically. And it's not as strange happens, it just gets slightly uh, higher, you know, louder and louder, and the frequency gets higher. Then the two black holes, or the two neutron stars, start touching each other. We talk of merger, they merge. And then what is left is a single black hole, because you just match the two of them together. Since it was born in a violent way, it's not spherical, it's out of equilibrium. So he has to release the excess of, equilibrium, of, uh, of energy, and we, we talk of ring down in this, in this phase. And this is the very last bit of the waveform. So here is right after the merger, when the mass is happening, and then basically it goes down to zero because it's releasing all the gravitational wave uh, energy left over. <coughs> I guess you're all asking this question. And now, this is all very nice, but does it work? You know, we have these small distances, and black holes are very weird objects. Maybe you made it all up. Uh, yes, it does. Uh, unless you have been living in a different planet, you have heard that uh, in the last year, LIGO and, and the Virgo collaboration detected two such binary black holes. So the gravitational waves coming from two of these <laughs> mergers. And it was nice. It was everywhere in uh, PRL. And here you can find, we actually had a third object so which we cannot claim with certainty that it was a black hole. I am personally a believer, but okay. So we, we claim detection of two of them. And you can also see these are the waveforms. They look a lot like the one I just showed you. And now I should also say that pretty much in the same way, uh, if uh, Cora looks at the CMB spectrum, 
from each of the features, like the, you know, the peak, uh, the, the throat, or whatever, she can learn something about the universe. If I look at one of these waveform, from each of these features, like the, their duration, or the amplitude, or whatever, I can say something about the source. Um, okay, so this was everywhere in the news. Uh, we got the congratulation from Obama, which I think is nice. Uh, I, I put this because two things uh, are particularly funny to me. The first one is that in the Washington Post, although we were pretty high in, uh, no, in importance, we were still below Meryl Streep, Beyonce, bloody mess, whatever that is, and Trumpism. And the other thing which I, I, I like is that the economist, given his you know, uh, orientation, took our merger and put us in the merger and acquisition session of, <laughs> of, of their paper, which I think it's, it's hilarious. Um, okay, uh, moving forward. So what did we learn? We got these two objects. I promise you we would learn something about black holes. Did we? Yes. So we learned a few things. First of all, we learned that black holes can be uh, significantly more massive than what was previously uh, found and discovered with the electromagnetic uh, mission. So in this uh, plot here, in this cartoon, you see on the x-axis the total mass of, of the black hole. This is 20, 40, 60, if you're going to read it from there. Now, the blue objects are the black holes that were previously known through electromagnetic observations. Okay? And you can see they all live somewhere in between 5 and you know, 20 solar masses, maybe. The red points with their arrow bars are the two and maybe three black holes that we discovered with LIGO. And you can see... Like in some cases, like this guy here, they are significantly more massive and, and, and scary than what was uh, found before. Uh, you know, these are 35 and this is 60 solar masses. Now, in the next few years, it's going to be funny to discover why we see this. Are we targeting a different population or do the electromagnetic uh, you know, methods have some selection bias or a combination of both? We don't know yet. It's going to be interesting. We also learned something uh, um, about the stars that this black hole came from. The fact that they could get so massive has, a, has implications on the metallicity of their progenitor star, in particular, puts an upper limit. And we can talk about this if you want at the coffee break. But basically, if you have too much metal, you cool early so you cannot become that big. We also discover and actually show that black holes can indeed spin around their <coughs> axis. Now, so for one, of, for one of them, we could say with pretty high certainty that it was spinning. And for all of them, we could say basically that they are not ma maximally spinning. So they are far from this theoretical limit that uh, some people think, at least most people think, should be, should be there. And now, this may seem pretty vague. I'm not telling you that the spin was 0.03 plus minus something. However, the important thing is that these are the first direct measurement of spins of black hole ever made by the human uh, kind. And let me tell you what I mean here. Uh, we already measured masses and spins of black holes, OK? But the way we have done it, it's an indirect measurement. So first of all, what you need is a black hole in a binary system we, we call X-ray binary. So if you want to measure, for example, the spin of black hole in this way, what you are measuring is not the spin of black hole. You are measuring properties of the disk of gas around the black hole. OK, I'll show a plot just to impress you. I will not go to it. Uh, so you are measuring something about the disk, and from that you infer the spin. Same thing about the mass. What you are measuring, if you want to know the mass of the black hole, is the mass of this guy Okay, in this velocity. So it's, it's different. What we are seeing instead here is the direct imprint of black hole mass and spin on the space-time. So it's a much uh, cleaner measurement. OK, moving forward, you may have read this. And thank you for the congratulations. <laughs> However, it's, it's, you know, yes, I showed this before. This is wrong, OK? We have not shown that Einstein was right. If I were the editor of, of CNN, the CNN, I would have titled this. It's not as catchy, <laughs> but Einstein was not wrong. That's what we have. Uh, shown. And, or actually, even better, the gravitational wave signal detected by LIGO are compatible with what predicted by Einstein. And by the way, you cannot prove that the theory is right, only that it's wrong. Okay? You can see also, as I have a future, future in journalism, if physics doesn't work. <laughs> um, so I'll give you one example of what I mean uh, with this. There we go. I'll give you one example it's something called massive gravity. Now, if you believe in, in, in Einstein, in GR, um, 
the gravitational wave forces, a force in hence gravitational waves, are carried by, well, they travel at the speed of light, first of all. So if you like to think in a quantum uh, you know, point of view, this means that they are mediated by a particle called graviton, which is massless, okay, like the photon. And now, if general relativity is wrong, you may think that the graviton may have a, a, a non-zero mass, very small but non-zero. So one of the things we have done with, um, with our uh, discoveries is trying to put an upper limit on, on the mass of this graviton. Now, don't look at the plot. We can focus just on, on the equation here. We put an upper limit on the mass of this hypothetical graviton to be something incredibly small. This 1.2, 10 to the minus 22 in this final units, which is the electron volt over C square. Now, uh, John, you are a particle physicist. He will tell you that the uh, neutrino is much, 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 much bigger than this. So it's a very small number, but it's not zero. This is the point. If we had decided that this was zero, we could have you know, maybe said, OK, Einstein was right, it's zero. By putting an upper limit, we say that zero is compatible with what we found, which is a very different thing, OK? So what I, what I mean here is that in the next few months and years, we can either prove that GR is wrong if we find a violation of it, or we can just say that it keeps being confirmed by the data, OK? Now, in the next uh, few minutes, actually, I'm, I'm early, which is good for coffee break, uh, I want to say something about what happens next. Let me start with the, what, I, what I do in particular, which is, uh, as, as I said, neutron star black holes. Now, LIGO will restart uh, collecting data later in October uh, for another six months. And, and then, well, then just small pause and we continue for the next few years. Anyway, so in the next months and years, we expect to detect way more of these binary black holes. And hopefully, since we know they are out there, we should also start detecting uh, binary neutron stars. So part of my job in the next few years is going to be to uh, try to characterize these objects, the underlying population, its properties. And uh, also keep uh, performing tests of general relativity. And the nice thing about most of what we do is that we can stack a, you know, a detection. So from 10, we learn more than what we learned with the first one. Okay, so our tests will get better and better with time. And now, uh, I, although my, my talk has only focused on compact binaries, there are other potential sources of gravitational waves, for example, supernovae explosions, okay? And so hopefully soon we'll start to detect some of these other interesting objects, or what I personally would prefer, see something which we have no idea what it is, okay? In science, typically, this is the most exciting thing that can happen. Um, Something that I also uh, involve with people at MIT, it's uh, uh, thinking about what happened next. Now, if you remember the first or second slide of Cora's talk, she had this 1.3 billion history of the universe, you know, in, in, in one slide. And now we, with LIGO, are targeting sources and black holes, which are in our backyard. They are a redshift of 0.5, maybe. So they are pretty nearby. And, and most, well, a lot of inter interesting stuff happens well, earlier or farther away. It depends how you want to think about <laughs> this. So we are, uh, with people, we are working on uh, conceiving and thinking about the next generation of uh, ground-based gravitational wave observatories. We even have names. We have names before we have money, which is it's nice, personally. Um, and these guys, once they get online, we are talking uh, uh, 15 years, to be optimistic. They will be sensitive to black holes basically as far as you have stars in the universe. So to redshift of six or 10, and not even more. We can see black holes up to redshift of 20 with these uh, objects. Okay, in the last uh, one or two minutes, I would like to um, even expand a bit more uh, the horizon here and, and stress the fact that there are several astrophysical phenomena which are, uh, will be producing detectable gravitational waves. Now, in my talk, I focused here on terrestrial interferometers, and here is the LIGO uh, observatory in uh, Amford, uh, Washington State. Now, as I said, this kind of detector target uh, supernovae, compact binary, and something like this. And they are sensitive to frequencies on the order of 100 Hertz, tens to 100 Hertz. This is not all of it, OK? Cora already mentioned uh, BICEP and the other experiments, which on the other side of the spectrum, very early on in the age of the universe, this 
zero, whatever that means, and they are targeting uh, gravitational waves from the very big bang, okay? Which will hopefully happen, in, as, as she said, in the next uh, few years. In the middle, there is a lot of more other things happening. For example, we have already now taking data something called the pulsar timing array. They target black hole, uh, gravitational waves emitted by supermassive black holes, like the one at the centers of the galaxies. And uh, the way it works is pretty, is pretty nice. So around us, there are all these pulsars, okay, which emit uh, flashes of light in a very stable periodic way. So you can use them as clocks, basically. So if a gravitational wave a train passes in the universe, it will change by a tiny amount the distance between us and each of these pulsars in a different way. So by timing very precisely the arrival time of these pulses, we can measure gravitational waves. And hopefully they will get something, a positive result soon. Something else that will happen uh, in the next five to 10 years, hopefully, it's something called LISA. LISA is basically uh, another interferometer, so it's kind of like LIGO, but it's on space, okay? So its arms, instead of being four kilometers, will be a few millions or billions of kilometers, I don't remember now. And um, so because they're not on the ground, they're not limited by seismic noise or by the, the earth shaking. Uh, so they can go to lower frequencies fraction of uh, Earth's and milliherzes. And if you are sensitive to these frequencies, what you can look uh, for is, uh, again, well, heavier compact binaries and also extreme mass ratios. This is a very big black hole with a very small one going around it, okay? Or again, supermassive black hole at the center of the galaxies. So I think it's, we can say that in the next, what, 10 years or so, we'll have a pretty good idea and we'll have detected gravitational waves from everywhere in, you know, in the spectrum. And so I, this is my last slide. I updated my slides at the end in the spirit of Dante and I put this quote from uh, uh, the Divine Comedy which is Equindi uscimo rivedere le stelle which means and then we went out to see the stars again. Now my stars are dead and, and black. Okay, that's my fault. Thank you. So I was curious, what is, can you explain to me and perhaps the audience what the Hawking limit is, how it arises for a spinning black hole? Yeah, okay, so the idea is the following. Uh, as you may have heard, black holes are singularities in, in the fabric of space-time, okay? Um, now, um, I think it was Hawking came out with something which is called the cosmic uh, um, censorship conjecture which uh, says that you cannot have naked singularities in the, you know, the space-time. There are a few reasons. Uh, if the black hole is spinning, you can violate casualty and other funny things. So the way uh, we protect ourselves from these weird things happening is that we put a singularity around the black hole where lights cannot come out, as you know, well, zero order. So even if something very weird happens inside, we cannot see it, so it's okay. Um, now, it turns out that if the spin of the black hole is larger than uh, some value, the horizons disappear. So you would be left with a free, uh, you know, visible naked singularity. And again, so this is a conjecture. If you don't want naked singularity, you need to have horizon, then the uh, spin has a limit. Okay, we want to prove that. Okay, first question. Right, you said that the, that the upper limit of black hole's mass remains to be defined. What about the lower limit of mass of black hole in order for it to have a gravitational, observable gra gravitational effect? And secondly, how abundant are the binary black holes as, com as opposed to single, single black holes? Can you repeat the second question? How abundant are binary oh, I black see. holes okay. As, okay. as opposed okay. to single. Okay, so the, the, okay, the first question is, uh, I, I focus on the high side of the mass of black holes, what about the low side? Which is a great question. Uh, right now, there uh, seem to be a, a gap between the mass of neutron stars and the mass of black holes. I said that neutron stars have masses which uh, uh, are around 1.4, 1.5 solar masses. Black holes, instead, seem to start from five or six solar masses. And a priori, there is no reason why it should be so, okay? You may expect black holes at two, three, four, or whatever. 
Now, this may be due to uh, an observational bias or just we have been unlucky, okay, it happens. The samples of black holes I show you, have you seen, it's 20 maybe. We don't know that many black holes yet. Um, so that is one of the things we want to verify in the next uh, uh, you know, few months and years, whether we will detect black holes which are you know, in the gap, basically, so which are low, masses lower than uh, uh, six or five. And the second question is uh, uh, how many more binary black holes there are as opposed to individual black holes. Uh, now, if you had asked me this question a year ago, well, a year and a, few, and a couple of months ago, I would have told you maybe zero, because one of the, the nice thing about our discovery is that it showed that you can have binary black holes, because there were uh, astrophysical models which said, not very many of them, but there were astrophysical models which said you cannot form a binary black hole, basically, okay? And now we found one, so they are out there. How, how more frequent, well, I guess we need some more time to uh, you know, decide. We know that a lot of the stars in the universe, and actually my colleague astronomers know maybe the exact number, which I don't know, maybe 60%, 70% are in binaries. Okay, a lot of stars in the universe are in binaries, okay? So since our black holes were stars to start with, you can think that, you know, there is a significant fraction of them. The, the, you know, the problem is that to become black hole, you need to become a supernova. And supernova is a pretty extreme and violent phenomenon. So some people think that when both objects, one at a time, go supernova, they can destroy the binary system. They can, you know, basically shoot the two objects in, uh, in different directions. So all of these are things that, if you invite me next year, I will, <laughs> no, I don't know. Uh, we'll see. It, uh, we, will, uh, we, will, uh, we have calculated already a rate of how often this happens in the universe, okay? And the rate is such that I I with uh, our detectors, we should see on the order of, uh, already now, a few of these objects per month, okay? So they're pretty common. Uh, if we talk with me on the coffee break, I don't remember the number, I can tell you how many of these you have each megaparsec cube each year, okay? Which is what astronomers uh, like to quote, I don't remember, it's like 30 or 40. So they're not so uncommon. Thank you. Okay, are there some other questions? I have, oh, oh over here, okay. I have one for Cora. Uh, I just wonder, uh, I get the impression that by microwave background and by pulsar arrays and by LIGO, almost simultaneously, uh, gravitational wave or the effects of gravitational waves seem to come into uh, reach of measurement. And I wonder whether this is a chance coincidence or is it an intrinsic reason, since we're talking about really, really different orders of magnitude, and you could imagine that they, they one effect is, is detectable and the, the other is many, many orders of magnitudes far from being measured. What do you want to? Please. <laughs> I can. I can. So your question is why we can measure, can, can, so let me rephrase your question. Your question is why we can seem, we seem to be able to measure. Uh, Effects of gravitational waves simultaneously on very different orders of magnitude. Yes, so well, the, the gravi so first of all, the gravitational waves that, that, for example, we would be able to measure with the CMB, come from a different source, right? So they come from uh, the quantum fluctuations of the metric that get stretched out in the period of 10 to the minus 35 seconds or so after the Big Bang. So these are primordial gravitational waves. Now, the, the gravitational waves that he was talking about come from, uh, that Salvatore was talking about, come from a different source. These are coming from uh, uh, merging black holes. So, um, so different effects, different effects, different physical effects produce gravitational waves at different scales. That's why we are looking, we are looking at different no, scales. I, no, I think I think the question, and let me see if I can rephrase it, is: is you you find it surprising that 
we have sensitivity across different scales now. The instrumentation, the instrumentation seems to be giving us all at the same time the sensitivity. And why, why is this? Why is the instrumentation at uh, okay. this level? So I, I mean, I, I think <laughs> physicists tend to be optimistic in general. So we may not, you know, the fact that I'm, we are putting limits and they're putting limits. I don't know if this. I, I think it's. You know, I don't, they, well, they already put, they already have a detection. We don't have a detection yet. So I think this is completely coincidental that, yeah. you know, we are still looking maybe, for gravitational waves. Okay, maybe I can add. Yeah, so we don't, sh there is not hardware in common or anything. There has not been a breakthrough, you know, that worked for both of us or for the pulsar. It's just, yeah. I think I, I can offer maybe one thought, but I don't Please. know. I mean. It's one issue is that quantum mechanics was sort of a playground to understand physics for a long time. But now quantum mechanics is being applied to devices and instrumentation is starting to blossom. And so you're, you're starting to see very sensitive, low temperature uh, technologies that are being brought to bear that, that give us these windows. Um, so I mean, I can't go into too much more detail, but if you look at the detectors for CMB polarization, they've been evolving over quite some time, and, and, mm -hmm. and the detector technologies for LIGO as well, and, and they rely on an understanding of quantum mechanics and kind of engineering of quantum mechanics, if you like. And I think that what that has done is it's gotten to a certain level of maturity that gives us new windows. Now, that doesn't explain why you're able to get gravitational wave sensitivities in both cases, but it is the the advent of these super sensitive measurement techniques that have been evolving out of quantum mechanical technology, I guess. Would that, does that work for you? Yeah, let, let me <laughs> add something. So the limits, I talked about the limits put by BICEP because, you know, because of things that we know, <laughs> because BICEP became very visible. But the limits on gravitational, on primordial gravitational waves were there way before. So BICEP made it, you know, made an order of magnitude improvement, but they have been there for years and years uh, before. So n nothing is particular <coughs> special, I would say, about this period. We are making progress, but this progress has been, you know, sort of in a continuous going on for years and years. Well, I just want to add that Einstein uh, uh, came out with GR in 1916, and we made the discovery in 2016. Oh, yeah, we just cool. waited for it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm joking. It was accidental. It was very nice. It was very accidental. OK, other questions? So my question is, uh, one of the things Salvatore touched on is the way in which science is reported. And, you know, I'm very interested in, you know, the, the sort of popular conception of how things are and, you know, the occasional headlines that you read. So a couple of headlines I've seen very recently were one of them was cosmic radiation may feed forms of life that we're, we're discovering, you know, that, that in fact you, you don't need the sort of standard formula that we're using now to create life. And the other one was just over the last day or so, that there may be something like 10 times more galaxies um, that, that uh, some, of, some of the things that have been coming back from Hubble are, <laughs> you know, indicating that we're undershooting by an order of magnitude. So I'm interested in hearing, you know, a little bit more about how you, how you feel, you know, science is reported <laughs> and what you would like to see in science reporting that maybe you're not getting. Do you want to go first? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, yeah, uh, well, I think I already expressed my, uh, my opinion. <laughs> I understand that, you know, if you had written Einstein, it was not wrong, you would not have sold the copies. Um, but it's, uh, I, yeah, I suggest you always try to read the source. So m most often, if you read CNN or New York Times or whatever, they will have their fleshy title, but then there is also a link to the actual, you know, um, article, the scientific article where things are discussed. So I, I always try to go this extra step, even for you know, information which is not pertinent to my own field. And uh, yeah, I, I guess, yeah, I guess I'm, that's my take. OK, yeah. I, um, so I, I have two things to say. The first one is, the first one is that uh, in general, you know, 
in the news we read things that are very showy. There is sort of a tendency to make, you know, a, a, a big title and to put lots of lights into, into certain, you know, into breakthroughs or to, 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 to put those uh, headlines. But really, it is... The, the, the continuous progress that, that is being done in science, that should be per se something really exciting. And so I think that the tendency to overblow, to, to say, you know, in his case, Einstein was right, or, uh, well, in the case of gravitational waves, it's, uh, it's a different story, but, but we all know the story of bicep. It's uh, people are willing to see some breakthrough, some big, you know, titles and, and, and really the excitement, of course that is very excitement, but the excitement, sometimes the excitement doesn't have to be like in a Hollywood movie in which <laughs> everything is, you know, so dramatic. The excitement is actually to make these steps of progress that we are continuously making. And uh, the second thing is that some, something curious that happened after the, I, I don't know if it's so much related to your question, but I just wanted to, to share my opinion. Uh, something curious that happened after the, the BICEP announcement was that, um, well, the paper came out the same day of the announcement. And because the announcement in the newspapers was so big, the community served as a sort of as a peer review. So the peer review done by the by different parts of the community was happening at the same time that these news were appearing in the newspaper. So I think sometimes it should happen in the opposite way, right? The, it should appear in the news after the peer review. Uh, because so this 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 was a little bit of the chaos that happened then was due to everything coming out together because there was such an urge for showing such a big title when when it was really impressive what happened in any case they they made an improvement the bicep team made an improvement of an order of magnitude compared to the constraints that existed before and that's already for us who work in the field something incredible and, 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 and worth a title in the newspapers. Yeah, and then I can just very quickly mention that obviously I agree with Cora and I can share maybe the experience from our side. What happened is that uh, the press uh, conference and release was held after the paper had been accepted by, by PRL, so it already been peer-reviewed peer by, uh, I don't remember how many now, reviewers, a lot. And, and indeed, the reason why was that uh, the field of gravitational waves has a uh, bumpy, uh, you know, uh, past. Uh, there have been <laughs> claims in the, you know, 70s, maybe something like this? 60s. 60s? Yeah. Of detection Weber. that then they've been Weber. not been replicated, so they're probably not true. And obviously there has been, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the bicep paper, so we wanted to be extremely careful and, you know, so over the last, we made the discovery in September and we announced it in February, which means that you know, for five months we have become very good at lying to people, like family, you know, friends, and so on and so forth. <laughs> like the CIA agent who comes home, and, you know. <laughs> okay, so why don't we take a break, we'll resume at three o'clock.